Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women's Wednesdays, which is hosted by Equality Bahamas pretty much on a monthly basis. This month, we gave you a double dose, so you got a bonus for the month of August, and this is our second session for the month, and we're joined by Hannah Baird, who is a very young homeowner, a new homeowner, and also a real estate agent, and she is here to tell us about her personal experience as well as share a little bit of her expertise and let us know what we need to be thinking about and how we can go about this seemingly very complicated process of finding property or a house, making the purchase, getting pre-qualified, figuring out how to how to work a mortgage, um, all of the sort of mysterious things that people don't really talk about because it gets a little bit personal and people don't really want to tell you all their business like that. But we'll see how much of her business Hannah's going to share with us today. Uh, throughout the session, please feel free to engage. You can use the chat to ask any questions or make any comments. Um, if you do want to use your mic, I just ask that you use the raise your hand feature to avoid any crosstalk so that we can just make sure that it's always one person talking at a time. So with that, we're going to jump right into it. And Han, I'm going to kick it over to you just to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for having me. I'm excited to tell you all my business. <laughs> um, okay, so as you mentioned, I am very young. I just turned 25 a few weeks ago. Um, so I went to school in England. I came home 2019, right before the pandemic. And now I'm at this, I'm, you know, I'm in my house right now. Uh, so it took basically that time between when I moved home to now to get to this stage. So today I'm looking forward to basically explaining how I got here, um, answering questions people might have about the same process and basically encouraging more people to do the same if that's something that you think you'd like to do. Um, okay, uh, do you have any questions to start or should I just start rambling? <laughs> I mean, I guess tell us, I think that sounds pretty impressive to me. Like you, you moved back home in 2019, it's now 2022 and you have moved in to your home. That seems like a really short space of time to have done all the things that it takes to have a home. So did you buy a house or did you build and where did you start? What did that process look like? Okay. Okay. So first of all, move in is a strong word. <laughs> um, I moved my stuff in. <laughs> I tried to move in. <laughs> um, and then I realized, wow, this is not livable. So I moved straight back out. <laughs> Basically with the theme throughout my story, I guess, is that um, I'm just taking things as they come and trying to make things work because it is a very difficult process. And even as an agent, I'm very frank about that. I think people should be prepared for what they're getting themselves into because I quite frankly wasn't <laughs> when I started getting into it. Um, so I, I was doing my master's in England, I think, when I decided that I wanted to move home for sure. Um, and I always liked real estate. My grandmother was a broker. So I guess grew up with an interest of just being around real estate all the time. Um, I, and I'm also a writer. So I did some writing for a real estate firm, like an internship when I was still in school one summer. And of course I had to write things for them about their properties. So I would just be on their website all day, just scrolling the properties. And I was like, wow, because this was my second year in university. And I was like, I'm not going to be able to buy anything <laughs> when I move home. <laughs> um, I started playing around with their mortgage calculator. Um, and I realized like, I mean, at this time, I'm thinking about graduating and I'm also thinking about moving home and I know what graduate salaries look like. And I'm like, wow, I can't buy anything for like 10 years <laughs> because, you know, mortgage is such a scary word and people are kind of trained to look at them negatively. Um, and obviously, I mean, that was the mindset I had as well. Like they taught us in accounts, you know, mortgage comes from the word board, which is French for death <laughs> because it's implied you'll be paying till you die. <laughs> so when I learned that, I was like, oh, that's not going to be me. I'll never be me. I'm gonna buy cash and I'm gonna work really hard and do that. And I got humbled very quickly when I was looking at those property prices. Um, but I still knew that, you know, that was something I wanted for myself. Um, obviously in countries like the UK and the US, it's more common that you find um, people, young adults house sharing. So that's how people kind of split their living expenses. But I knew that's not such a huge, you know, possibility over here. And I figured, well, I don't wanna live with my parents forever. And it's not exactly like, I can go, or I mean, there aren't even that many options for single people to go and, you know, rent, for example, by themselves. So I was like, well, I might as well look towards buying something myself. So I started playing around with mortgage calculators and I realized, okay, if I get to, let's say five figures in savings, I could start thinking about buying something and I could approach a bank. Um, so while I was in school, I was paying all my 
bills myself. So I had already gotten used to paying rent and everything. And I was like, okay, I've been managing, I've, you know, been surviving <laughs> with that. So I was like, I'm pretty sure I could handle, you know, just replacing rent with a mortgage instead. So I set that goal of saving five figures. I worked two jobs while I was in school. Um, and I got to that savings goal, right? I moved home in August. I think I hit that goal in August and I turned 22 that August. So it was a big August for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, once I hit that mark and then I went to the bank and I said, well, actually I was telling my coworker that because she also bought a property when she was, I think 25, she bought a, an apartment. Um, and I told her my plan and she was like, go to the bank. And I was like, oh, I'm not ready yet. You know, I want to decide on a property first. And she was like, go to the bank, like you're wasting your time. <laughs> And I'm going to come back to this because this is one of the biggest pitfalls that people make when they decide they want to, you know, buy their own property um, is that they don't get pre-qualified. And then when they get pre-qualified, it's a huge disappointment that you can't buy what you thought you were going to buy. So I was telling her, oh, there's this house for 350000 and, you know, I have enough savings, like it's manageable for me to um, pay this. Like I did a mortgage calculator, I was like, it'll be fine. I went to the bank and I surely did not qualify for <laughs> 350000 but I did requalify for something. Um, and, you know, I could have bought an apartment, but all the ones I was interested in were like new builds and just some backstory. My dad is a contractor. So I figured if I'm going to be waiting for a building to be built anyway, I could just build it myself and my dad could help me out with that. So in the end, I decided to buy a vacant land, some vacant land and build a multifamily property, which is a duplex. At the moment, it is a oneplex because <laughs> I cannot afford to build a full duplex right now. Um, but yeah, that was how I got to this point. At this point, I was not a real estate agent. Um, so this was literally just me saying, I want to do this and I'm going to do it. And I found a way to do it. Um, the plan initially was to buy the mortgage, well, finance through the bank to buy the land, which is what I did. That was February, 2020. And then we all know what happened in March, 2020. Um, <laughs> so the um, construction costs also skyrocketed after that. So what I initially thought I could qualify for to fund the construction, I no longer qualified for because construction costs went up so high. Um, so I, I, at this point I was stuck with um, this very high interest loan, <laughs> a piece of land that I couldn't do anything with. So I just said, I'm just gonna do it myself. <laughs> um, and that was either the dumbest thing or the smartest thing I've ever done. <laughs> I mean, obviously in the end, I got to the point where it's livable. I have a good amount of equity in the property, um, but it was very tough. Um, and I was just saying earlier, my, you know, I'm a real estate agent. I love real estate, but I, it's not my only source of income. I need to have multiple sources of income to fund something like this. Um, and that's something that no one really wants to hear, <laughs> but it's like, it is so hard. It is so expensive. And even with me having three, sometimes four streams of income, um, it's been hard. <laughs> it's been very hard. Um, but in the end, it does pay off. Um, I'm trying to think if I didn't cover anything in that story. I don't think so. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty much how I came to this point now. And then becoming an agent came afterwards. So what I'd like to share with you guys today is what I learned from my own story of kind of rushing into it and just being, I guess, too eager <laughs> um, and making a bunch of mistakes along the way. And then what I've learned from my industry insight now looking back on what I should have been doing. Um, the other thing I also didn't do, which was kind of dumb, was I didn't work with an agent. <laughs> um, it was a direct, <laughs> it was a direct purchase. So I was literally just fumbling my way through the sale. And then I continued fumbling through the construction. Um, but I mean, I, I do need to get an updated appraisal now to see where the property value exists now, but as an agent, I have a pretty good idea. And it, I'd like to say that it turned out to be very profitable, not just profitable, profitable um, financially, but I've learned so much about myself. I mean, that sounds so corny, but it's like, the discipline and you know level of responsibility that you need to pull off something like this is like, it just gives you a whole new insight on life, I guess. <laughs> um, I don't know how else to put it. I guess it'll come out more the more that we talk today. But yeah, in conclusion, that's my story. Um, if there's any more questions at this point, 
uh, we could go from there. Yeah, um, folks, please put your questions or challenges or anything in the chat. I'll be looking at them as we go through. Um, so it sounds like the first step people should take is to figure out how much money they can get from the bank, right? So you need to get pre-qualified. What does that mean and how do you do that? For sure. So a pre-qualification is when you go to a bank or lender and they will ask you what's your income, what's your expenses. Um, and then from that, they will give you a figure that you should be able to borrow from them um, that would allow you to comfortably pay them back. So for example, if you're making 20,000 a year, they're not going to lend you a million because they need to know based on what you um, what you have left over after your expenses every week, um, every month can pay back that million that you borrowed from them. Um, so that's why I said I was like set on this $350,000 house and they were like, mm, it's not happening. <laughs> so I can't tell you how many times I had to like re-strategize and reformulate my plans based on my financial situation. So the best thing for sure, even if you don't have the savings yet, just go to the bank. It's free. You know, they're not going to judge you or laugh at you. <laughs> they're just going to look at that figure and tell you this is what you could qualify for. And then from there, you should know how much you should save for your down payment, how much you should save for closing costs and it, it just makes it easier to work towards that figure. Um, so what do you need to take with you to the bank for this appointment? Um, honestly, sometimes just yourself. <laughs> At the appointment, sometimes they tell you what they need you to, um, what else they might need from you, but generally, yeah, they take they generally take the official documents afterwards, but at first you could just tell them, I make this amount. Um, expenses are this amount. And then that's why it's a pre-qualification. It's just a general figure that you should look, um, that should, you know, work for you. But um, when it comes to the actual qualification, that's when they'll say, I need a job letter. I need copies of your bills. I need, you know, the typical bank stuff, proof of address, your ID, um, all that stuff. Um, things that come into consideration, and this is a huge pitfall for young people, especially, is that they will look at all of your current debts. So credit cards, car loans. <laughs> that is a huge one for young people who want a BMW straight out of school and then want to buy a $500,000 house. <laughs> um, all of those things will take your pre-qualification down. So if buying property is a priority for you, I would say try and get that done first. So in my case, I bought my little Japanese car when I was 18 <laughs> cash and I was like, this will have to do <laughs> until I get what I what's my priority, which was the property. Um, so I think that was why I got for my age, I got a pretty high qual pre qualification. Um, and then afterwards, I was like, okay, once that's done, now I can go back with my nice car. But <laughs> yeah, so that's the stuff that you'll want to consider um, when getting pre qualified. Okay, so you just basically need to know how much how much money you're bringing in and what your expenses are, like loans and bills. So if you're if you're in an apartment, mm -hmm. then they want to see your electricity bills and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, even rent would be considered because you need somewhere to live that, you know, that counts as a bill. It's a bill that you can't really escape unless you do decide to move back in with parents or something. So yeah, all of that stuff is considered into your pre-qualification amount. And um, do they want to know like how much you spend on gas and on food and things like that too, or just sort of these fixed expenses? Um, some banks, some banks would ask that stuff. Um, I'm not sure if it's across the board, but yeah, some, some would. Um, so it's also good to go with a figure in your head. So it just makes you look more responsible. So when I approached the bank, I was like, okay, so I was a business major. My undergrad was in business. Um, so I went to them with my own <laughs> personal statements that I had been tracking of my own expenses, like while I was in school. So I guess that was why they also were like, okay, this is a young girl, but clearly she knows how to budget. Like she has a track record of it. Um, so things like that do help. So knowing in your own head that those figures off the top just make you seem like a more eligible candidate. Because I mean, if you, if someone wants to borrow money from you, you also want to know that they can pay you back. You want to know they're responsible. So a, a good part of it is making, just making, just proving to the bank that you are responsible enough to handle it and going from there. Okay. And then we have a question in the chat. Is the pre-qualification strictly based on salary and expenses or are personal savings taken into consideration? No savings would be considered. So your down payment would be 
cash. Um, so if you are using your savings for your down payment, that means that, how do I explain this? Okay, um, that means the actual mortgage would only be the difference in the down payment versus the total property price. So if you're buying something for 200,000, but you have 50 grand saved in cash and you wanna put that as your down payment, you only need 150,000 as the loan. So definitely that's considered and having a significant amount of savings helps a lot when it comes to being able to buy a more expensive property. Okay. And for people who have joined us, uh, if you have questions about the pre-qualification or the actual qualification and the process, please put those in the chat. Um, but now I want to shift us to thinking about the difference between, aside from the obvious difference, between buying vacant land and a house. So what are some of the pros and cons that that people need to think about, particularly younger people, maybe people who don't have that much savings. Um, mm -hmm. And let's say people who don't have a safety net, like they, they, they can't mm -hmm. live at home. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely, that's why I try to disclose the fact that obviously my dad is a contractor. Like <laughs> I have fumbled through this so much. I'm like, any other contractor would have been like, this girl don't have no money, let me just, <laughs> I'm gone. Because so many times I've had to just like stop building because I just, I just run out of money. <laughs> but obviously he's my dad, he can't, <laughs> he can't really walk away. Um, but I mean, looking back on it, obviously I have had the safety net of being able to live with my parents until this was completed. But looking back, I mean, the pandemic, you stuck inside with your family for almost a year, solid. <laughs> Looking back, if I knew that this would have taken so long, I think that I actually would have rented somewhere and just had somewhere to live, had my own space in the meantime, um, and just push the, push, push the building back later. Um, so that is something that young people, I, I guess I'm speaking to my former self as well, <laughs> should take more into consideration because I thought this was gonna take nine months and it took like two, almost three years. <laughs> Um, so yeah, for sure, you want to make sure you're in a comfortable position if you decide to build. That's a concern that you won't really have as much if you're buying. Um, a lot of times I said, oh, I should have just bought somewhere and I could have been living there for two years already. Um, so yeah, obviously time, time frame. Um, and then there's so many hiccups along the way with building, like in my case, thinking you'll get a loan and then you don't, and then you're stuck with the vacant land. Another thing is that developed property has lower interest rates than vacant land or construction loans um, and a shorter payback period. Um, so this is where me working with an agent would have been very helpful. Those are very <laughs> important things to know. Yes. By it. Okay. <laughs> to tell me the things first. <laughs> so that's what also influenced my decision to go ahead and just do it out of pocket because I was like, now I'm stuck with this high interest loan on this vacant property I can't do anything on. So I was like, even if I don't finish it, I'm just going to go ahead and do what I can. Um, but that's for sure something I wish someone had told me straight up from the beginning. Um, so what do we cover? Time, interest, payback period. Um, I yeah, guess those one thing be, that, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, those might be the main things. Uh, what were you going to say? Sorry. One thing that I think about when I'm like weighing these options is if you're building, then you have, I think you have a better chance of customizing and having exactly yeah. what you want. Yeah. yeah. So sorry. I only mentioned the cons of building. I guess that's because the wound is still fresh, but <laughs> um, yeah, you can customize it. You can make sure it's modern. Um, that's something that I've definitely enjoyed is knowing that the things I'm putting in here are going to increase their property value because they're the current trends. Um, and you, you build up so much equity. Um, so equity, those who don't know, would be the difference in what you owe on a property and what you own on a property, basically. Um, for example, let's say you built a house that's now worth 400,000, you spent 200 building it and the land loan was 100. These are all hypotheticals, by the way, but um, in that case, you have $100,000 in equity and you could use that to um, buy another property. You can use that to get other loans. And that basically is what contributes to your net worth. Um, you know, when you hear these astronomical figures and people talk about like celebrity net worths and rich people net worths, the majority of it is real estate. That's, um, 
yeah, it's the value of their assets, which would be the property. Um, so building, building, I want to say is the quickest way to build up equity. Maybe not the easiest, but it'll likely give you the most unless you buy like a shack and turn it into a mansion. <laughs> yeah, and I think HGTV might be selling us dreams. Oh yeah, <laughs> on yeah. The, whole, the whole flipping <laughs> thing, right? Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, we know Nassau, well, not Nassau, the Bahamas in general is expensive to live in. Um, and of course, that is not untrue when it comes to construction and real estate. <laughs> so you do have to be realistic. Um, yeah, I mean, you can do it. You might want to, you don't, you know, maybe you don't mind living in a property that's not so nice for a few years and doing it piece piece, but it's not going to be overnight like how you see on, <laughs> on the flipping shows. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, someone's asking for the pros and cons of purchasing a repossessed property and renovating it. Okay. Um, so pros, obviously, again, you build up significant equity. Um, you might buy something that's really run down and valued at, let's say, 80000 and you might, let's say, inject 50 to 80 of your own money into it, and it might be valued 200 250 after you finish with it. Again, hypotheticals. <laughs> but um, so yeah, you build up equity again um you can monetize it just like with regular building but a huge con is that you don't know who the previous contractor was and if they knew what they were doing so a lot of people find that you know things weren't wired properly in the first place or there's some extreme structural damage and it ends up being way more than you bargained for whereas with building um I mean, hopefully you have a good contractor, but <laughs> you should be there for every stage to know, okay, this was done properly, this was done properly. I shouldn't have to pay to fix this for X amount of years. It's just more reassurance, I guess, than a fixer upper. It's kind of a gamble with fixer uppers. Is there anything in particular that if you're looking at a house, whether it's repossessed or not, um, any sort of telltale signs that something is wrong here, turn around and walk away? Um... So full disclosure, I haven't dealt with many fixer uppers myself as an agent. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything that comes to mind. I mean, obviously water damage could turn out, especially if you have like a multiple story building and you see some water damage on like the ceiling of the ground floor, which would imply there was like a huge leak on the second floor. Um, you know, that might cave in, that, <laughs> that might be a big problem. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say anything that I could think of necessarily that's like a huge red flag, but that that one is pretty concerning. That might be a, a very big build to fix, <laughs> depending on how bad it is and how long it was left. And that's the thing when you're buying, you don't necessarily know unless the owner has been doing, you know, uh, incremental appraisals at different points. Um, if I think of any later on, I might come back to this, but at the moment, <laughs> I think that might be the main thing to me that I think would, as a buyer and an agent would be concerning. <laughs> and I know people often say too, when you're looking at a house to go at different times. So go to see what it looks mm -hmm. like at night and how well lit it is and go after it rains to see uh -huh. like if mm. it's <laughs> collecting water in the yard and like different uh -huh. things like that. Talk to the neighbors. And I thought especially. <laughs> Um, and that is a good thing with building is that you can obviously build higher up based on what, you know, the trends are. Um, and, you know, you could build with hurricane proof windows now instead of going back later on and adding all these things. Um, but for sure, you want to get a good feel for the neighborhood. Um, luckily, where I bought was a place that I know very well. Um, but yeah, you want to see it in the day, in the night, see how busy it is, um, see if there's traffic that's going to drive you insane. <laughs> um, and like you said, for sure, flooding in Nassau especially is a big one, especially now where we're seeing areas that never used to flood are now starting to flood. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. whether you're buying or building, I think you probably want to visit that site mm -hmm. at different yeah. times. You want to visit probably at peak traffic times, Yes. <laughs> middle of the night, after the rain, all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we have someone saying for a novice buyer, what's the best way to compare prices in the area? So like, how do you know that you're getting a fair deal? I guess, based on the other homes. On um, the so this is the good thing about 2022 is that so many of these properties are just online. Um, and this is why I kind of felt comfortable enough to buy um, when I was, you know, young, because I had been browsing websites just because I like real estate. I'd been browsing them for years before I put down an offer. Um, but obviously working with an agent, I mean, when you are a buyer, you don't pay the agent. And this is something I think a lot of people don't really understand. The seller is going to pay the agent when, you know, the when the deal closes. So it's not it's no cost to you to go to an agent and say, do you think this is a fair price or can you tell me some comparables in the area and they will help you. Um, and that's, yeah, I think that's probably the best way to get some industry professional insight. And with an agent, are you just calling up a random real estate company and being like, hey, tell me about this house? Or do you have to figure out who the seller is working with and only that agent can oh, no. help you? No, definitely not. That's another misconception that people have. People always come to me and they're like, hey, do you have any listings in XYZ? And I'm like, I might not have listings in XYZ, but that doesn't mean I can't help you. Basically, any property that's on the open market um, would have an agent representing them, but buyers can also have represent um, agents representing their own interests. Because if you think about it, the seller is going to want, you know, they're going to want a good profit on the sale. <laughs> the buyer is going to want it for a good price. So you would have an agent representing both sides to make sure that there's a happy agreement and you meet in the middle and everyone wins at the end of the day. Um, so you can call up random <laughs> agencies. Um, you could follow specific agents like me and <laughs> um, just say, hey, I'm looking for this. Uh, would you be able to help me out? And yeah, that's how it could work. Okay, I'm going to ask you again at the end, but um, can you tell people where they can find you and maybe type some links into the chat um, for people to be able yes. to reach you while I look at some of the other questions that are coming in? Uh, I am now typing my social media handles, which would be Twitter and Instagram. Um, so that's at Bahana, which is B A H H. A-N-N-A-H. Um, you could also send me an email at hbeard at bhhsb.com. Um, A lot of so, H's going on. Right? <laughs> so I, I work with Berkshire Hathaway. So that is my agency. Um, okay. So at Ba, like Bahamas, B-A-H, H-A-N-N-A-H yes. underscore is Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. And the email is hbeard, H-B-E-A-R-D at B-H-H-S-B dot com. So that's how you yes. get in touch with Hannah, people, if you need yeah. um, an agent to help you figure out if you're getting a good deal. Um, so somebody wants you to elaborate on fixer uppers and homes that are repossessed by the bank. So I'm not sure what they're asking. Maybe tell us what a fixer upper is and um, what that process is like. And then the same for repossessed. Yeah, so a fixer upper would be a property that's not in great condition and you would need to inject some cash to, to put it in good condition. Um, I think something that a lot of people don't know when they are buying fixer uppers is that in many cases, the bank will want you to also finance the construction or renovation of that house or you know, property building, whatever type of property it is. Um, so you would have to, first of all, qualify for the sale price of the property and then also likely have to qualify for what would be the industry average or rate for um, fixing it up. Um, and that's where a lot of people, that's a pitfall for a lot of people. Um, and actually that's technically what happened to me with my buildings that you know I qualified for a certain amount and the sale price plus the construction didn't fall within that amount, which is why I had to End up doing it myself but when it comes to fixer uppers i think a good amount of banks do require you to qualify for it, the whole thing because they don't want to take on the liability of something that's not in good condition um so that's something to consider um and it does happen you know 
pretty frequently is that people qualify for the sale price to buy the property, but not what it would um, cost to, to fix it up, so to say. Um, and then, yeah, I, they asked about repossessed homes as well. Um, there's a stigma with repossessed homes. They're not always in bad condition. Um, and you don't always know the story behind them. Um, sometimes it could have been that the owner died. I mean, that might be kind of grim, but it's not always that oh, they couldn't afford it, so the bank took it, so it must be in bad condition. Um, sometimes you do find, you know, really nice quality fixer, um, not fixer, but um, repossessed homes. Um, yeah, that's, that's that on that. <laughs> so if you're planning to build, then you, who decides, do you or the bank decides how much you're getting? Like I know there's, you qualify for a certain amount, but if you qualify mm -hmm. for more than you're paying for the property, mm -hmm. would the bank then offer you more money to be able to build? Or do you need to have some quotes to get the money to build? How does that work? You need quotes for sure. Um, and that was a big issue for me. <laughs> when I started getting those quotes in and they were above my qualification amount, <laughs> And that was when the bank was like, oh. <laughs> so that's when I had to re-strategize. Um, but I think it depends on the type of loan that you're going for. So if you do just want to buy the land itself, obviously, um, you know, they wouldn't be asking for quotes um, and stuff. But if you are going for a package deal where you are buying the land and construction in one, then obviously, yeah, they would ask for those extra things. Um, so it's a little different from fixer uppers because you don't always have to build on it. You can just buy vacant lands and it's just vacant land. You don't build on it. It really comes down to you and what you apply for in that case. Okay. So you kind of, you have to have a pretty good sense of what you want then. Like you need mm -hmm. to know that you want to build a duplex or you want to build a five yeah. bedroom house so you can mm -hmm. figure out what it's going to cost and if exactly. that's going to fit into your qualification. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's a lot of checking off boxes. Uh, uh, the bank, really, the bank wants to make sure they're covered before they give you a significant amount of money. <laughs> so that is why they'll be asking for all these documents. Um, so, and this is also why speaking to an agent is helpful because you might have some idea in your head that's completely unrealistic like me when I was 22 <laughs> sometimes you do need someone to tell you hey you know have you considered this instead or do you have a backup option if this doesn't work out um so it's good to speak to them tell them what you're looking for give them a bit of background information and they could kind of help you to go from there and figure out what might be best for you okay uh, someone is asking if we have building code inspectors in the Bahamas or are we just taking a gamble when we're looking at pre-owned homes? Um, I don't want to give the wrong information here, um, but I mean, obviously the Ministry of Works <laughs> would, I guess, be the building code inspectors. Um, I don't want to speak for the Ministry of Works, <laughs> but I want to say, I'm guessing you could get an inspector to come out, but I think most people do just go with regular appraisers um, so for those who don't know, an appraisal is a report that details um, the value of your property. So it'll tell you what condition everything's in. It'll say when it was built, um, if there's anything, you know, majorly wrong with the property or anything that is outstandingly good about the property. And it'll compare properties that are similar to yours. And that's how um, you would come to the conclusion of what a house is worth. So most people, I think, just go with you know, regular appraisals. I think that, did I answer the question properly? Um, yeah, so they uh, want to know if there's like some body that you can go to for inspections. Um, um, how you would know that if there's an electrical issue or if there's mold, mm -hmm. like how do you find that out before you buy? Um, okay, so an appraisal, unless the mold is really bad, I don't think they usually tend to go that deeply into detail, but there are also building, um, yeah, you could also get another, you know, a more technical inspection done. Um, but I think most people opt to just go with appraisal, appraisals, regular appraisals. Um, and if anything is like majorly wrong, I think they do usually mention that. I personally haven't seen, like I said, I don't really deal that much with fixed represent and whatnot. 
So I personally haven't seen that much, but um, when people want to know what they're getting into, basically they would get an appraisal beforehand. Mm-hmm. And, and I think fact, a lot of people take their own um, technical people as yes. well, like trades people, like yes. they'll take their own electrician to look. Yes, for sure. That's a huge thing here. Um, and on that note of appraisals, actually, if you are going to a bank, they will require an appraisal. So you aren't necessarily going into it completely blindly, but if you do want those um, industry specialists, like you mentioned, people do you know, bring their own electricians and stuff to kind of check out what's going on. Um, what, who pays for the appraisal and how much does it cost? Uh, the buyer. The buyer. Yeah, how much the does buyer, the appraisal run you? And that's gonna be a couple hundred. <laughs> um, it varies. Um, but I'm gonna say expect to spend at least 500 um, just to put a figure out there. You know, don't go to someone and say, oh, well, Hannah told me it's only gonna be 500. Um, <laughs> but I would say expect to spend at least that. It might be more, it might be less, um, but for sure a few hundred for a reason. Okay. And then for a contractor, because this is this is a really important person that mm-hmm. drives the work, right? Um, mm-hmm. Someone wants to know how how you find a contractor. Um, so if you are going to the bank, they have a list of approved contractors uh, sometimes, um, and they will have their own their own requirements for contractors to meet. So you have to be uh, licensed or registered. I don't remember the correct word with the ministry. Um, so yeah, going through the bank, if you are not working with someone who you know really well is a good way to kind of make sure that you're also protected because the bank is going to make sure that they are protected. (laughs) So they've got all these things to check off. Um, and in the process of you checking those off, it like, yeah, it does make sure that you're protected as well. Um, but was the question where you can find contractors? Yeah, how you recommend or finding a contract. I think you answered it, that the bank will typically yeah. give you a mm-hmm. list of, of approved people, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty. Um, they might not give you a list of approved people. I know for sure they have approved appraisers and approved lawyers. I think they might have preferred contractors, maybe not okay. approved, but they will only accept quotes from people who meet certain standards. So like I said, being registered or whatever the correct word is <laughs> with the ministry, they have to meet those standards. So. Um, that's how you kind of assure that you're working with someone who knows what they're doing and has been doing what they're doing for long enough to be, to meet those standards pretty much. Okay. And someone's asking the average fee for an agent. I think they mean a real estate agent. So to confirm, you're saying that buyers do not pay agents. No, buyers, buyers would pay, um, but it would generally be 6% or 10%. But again, that falls on the seller. Yeah. Of the, of the purchase price. That's what the seller pays. the agent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, someone's saying their dad always says to build to the belt course and then go to the bank to finish building. What do you think about that? Um, so when I was trying to get a loan, that was basically what I was told by the bank. They were like, get to belt course and then we could revisit it. Um, so that, yeah, that does sound like pretty sound advice. It does seem easier to get um to get a loan at that point and by that point you would have built up significant equity um so yeah i mean obviously it varies based on each person's individual circumstance but it does seem pretty pretty valid to say that for most people i think yeah you have to have the money to do that oh yeah (laughs) and i know that we talk when we talk about buying a house we we know certain things we know that it's going to cost a ton of money you got to try to get a mortgage. You need to come up with a down payment. But I happen to know from friends who have recently bought houses that there are all kinds of other things that you got to pay for that people don't oh, really yeah. talk about. <laughs> Can you talk to us about some of these things that just kind of yeah. pop up? <laughs> this is, again, a major pitfall that many young people, um, myself not being an ex- exception, <laughs> go through. Um, your closing costs can end up being the same, if not more, as your down payment. Um, so what's included in closing costs, those would be your legal fees, um, any government fees or taxes, um, and then VAT on those fees, which is, um, you know, a great time to be an adult (laughs) since VAT was introduced. (laughs) Um, Legal fees, generally, again, don't tell anyone 
Hannah said this, so it has to be this, but generally <laughs> are around 2.5% of the purchase price. There might be more, there might be less, but generally that's what you'll find most lawyers charging somewhere around there. And then but on top of that, um, stamp tax was just reduced significantly, which is great news. People who are looking to buy right now, it used to be 10% for most properties. I think it was, I want to say, I'm not going to say the exact figure, but anyway, it used to be 10% for most properties. And now they've adjusted to, um, I think it's, I'll have to get the exact figures up, but um, in fact, let me get the exact figures up right now. Uh, so we could go through them. But that is something that was a huge um, factor in high closing costs that kind of ran it up to be as much as your down payment. Um, the bank isn't I'll like, to... we're lending you 300,000 mm -hmm. for, you know, that your mortgage is 300,000. And, and it come back to us with the closing costs and we'll, we'll have yeah, that. sure. that's out of your pocket, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so now this just came into effect in July, which is why it's not, you know, memorized <laughs> word for word yet, but um, under 100,000, you're looking at 2.5%, 100 to 300,000, you're looking at 4%, 300,000 to 500,000, you're looking at 6%, 500,000 to 700,000, you're looking at 8%, 9% for 700,000 to a million, and then 10% at over a million. So compared to if you bought something in June for let's say 200,000, which would have been a 10% stamp tax rate, um, you're now looking at 4%. So that is a significant drop, which is great for those people who are trying to buy now. Um, would have been nice when I was buying, but <laughs> happy for many clients. <laughs> so if um, you're buying a $200,000 property, mm -hmm. you're paying $8,000 in stamp tax? Let's whip out this calculator. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. But the good news is as a first time buyer, you will likely be exempt from that stamp tax. Okay. Yeah. And do you but, have to do anything, jump, jump through any hoops to get that exemption? Um, not necessarily. Um, most first time buyers are exempt from it, uh, but not ones who are buying on vacant land, which is another thing I wish I <laughs> had an agent to tell me when I was buying mine. <laughs> um, and also, I mean, even if you do have to pay it, most cases it's split half and half between the buyer and seller. So you wouldn't be paying four percent to be paying two percent if you do have to pay it in most cases that is negotiable but that's the general standard um and like i said yeah as a first-time buyer you likely wouldn't have to pay that if you're buying an apartment but if you are buying vacant lot yeah that's something you have to factor into those closing costs um and again this is why i said i was fumbling through my own sale because I found out all these things along the way. So mm -hmm. <laughs> anything I could do to help other people to be more prepared, I am happy to share. Okay. So th this is, these are a lot of fees. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're looking at, when we're talking about $200,000 property, we're looking at about $4,000 stamp tax. You're looking at about $5,000 in lawyer fees. W what else? VAT on top of all of that. Yeah. Um, if you, let's say you're doing a 10% down payment, which would be 20,000 um you could find that these other fees also add up to around twenty thousand very quickly um what else are you missing um you might have to pay bank fees um i think commitment fees they're sometimes referred to and those might be around two percent one percent something like that so they they add up pretty quickly um so I do advise people that once they have their down payment saved, let's say you are buying something for 200,000 and your down payment is 20,000, I usually advise people be prepared to pay double that. You know, that quote, I think it's from Jay-Z, that's like, um, you can't afford it if you can't buy it twice. It's it's very true in real estate. <laughs> and I realized that very quickly. <laughs> um, yeah. Obviously you might not have to pay that, you might get your stamp tax exemption and that's you know a significant amount less. Um, but be prepared because as I've learned, anything can happen. <laughs> so you need, yeah, you need your down payment twice, once for the down payment and once for, for the, the closing costs, pretty, pretty much. Um, again, it might not end up being that expensive, but it might. So you should, you know, prepare yourself. Mm -hmm. um, someone's asking if your credit affects your ability to qualify for a mortgage. 
definitely. Um, so we don't have credit scores here yet, but I guess qualifications kind of are our equivalent um, because they are going to look at all your debt. So they're going to look at your credit cards. If you're paying them off, how many you have, what's the limit. Um, if you're paying them off <laughs> again, <laughs> because um, that would kind of suggest that maybe you are already struggling with paying back debts. So they're going to look at all that stuff and that will factor into how much you would qualify for. Um, again, I am not a, I'm not a bank <laughs> specialist, but mm -hmm. this is just, you know, what I know that they tend to do. So again, don't go to the bank and say, oh, well, Hannah said this, but you know, <laughs> these are the things that they tend to look at. Yeah. Um, someone's wondering about purchasing from a developer. I'm not going to say the name of the place. She's mentioning a place, but, or they're mentioning place, <laughs> but sort of these like little gated, mm -hmm. you know, lots of property and they all look the same and. Okay. Yeah, I saw that one in the chat. Um, I've actually gotten that question about that exact place a few times. Um, and I personally don't have experience there. So um, <laughs> I can't really give an opinion. I mean, if you yeah. can afford it, I think, sure. Um, yeah, it really comes down to what you can afford, what you prefer. Um, if you like if you want more freedom as to, you know, architectural design and stuff like that, you might not want to be in a gated community. But again, this is why it's best to speak to a, an agent because they will throw all these different things to consider at you um, and see what works best for your circumstance. Yeah. And, and talk to people who live in, in similar mm -hmm. um, communities yeah. as well. Cause they're, I mean, I think that people like them or opt for them because they can be a little bit easier. Like someone else is handling some of these things. Um, yeah. They come with restrictions. Yes, right? restrictions and extra costs. You will have mm -hmm. your HOAB, which you wouldn't have to pay if, you know, it's just a standalone home in a neighborhood. Um, so yeah, all these things to consider. Um, I can't speak to what that specific development's HOA is. Um, but what is yeah. HOA? Sorry, um, homeowners association fees. <laughs> So these are fees that you would pay like on a monthly basis if you live in one of these it areas? Vary. It varies for different places. Some, some are monthly, some are quarterly, some might be annually. Um, they vary in cost and they cover various things. So they might cover insurance. Most of them cover maintenance, especially if it is like, let's say a condo development and they all need to look the same because they're in the same building. They will likely cover um, painting and all that stuff. So external maintenance um yeah so it comes down to how much you want to do yourself and how much you're willing to pay to let someone else do it yeah uh, someone's asking what you think is the biggest barrier to home ownership in the bahamas um well as we just discussed probably costs <laughs> it is very costly and that's not something that i try to sugarcoat it is expensive and as i mentioned earlier i have had to have multiple jobs to fund it myself um so I know that as a buyer and also an agent. Um, but one thing that I will say is that once you do get to that point, it puts you in a completely different different ball game. Um, I, you know, I grew up around very wealthy people, and I'll never forget one of my closest friends said something that I thought was so out of touch, but it was so funny because it stuck with me. He said something like, "Oh, I feel like every Bahamian owns apartments," and I was like. <laughs> I was like, I don't think so, but it's, but it's like when you speak to people who come from money, that is their reality. Everyone around them owns multiple properties. Um, so why did I bring this up again? Um, yeah, it's not easy, but it's like once you do finally get to that stage, you're in a completely different, you know, ballpark. I think people think of home ownership and just think I own a home and that's it. But I think the actual financial benefits of it aren't that well shared. It's not just, oh, I could rent to someone. It's what you can leverage to get more things with that same property. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, think about it. If you sell a property that costs, let's say $400,000, what else can you do that could put $400,000 in your pocket? So all those things to consider rather than just, I own a home and that's the end of the discussion. Yeah. 
someone is saying it seems as if home ownership will not be achievable for the average Bahamian, even for the middle class. This information is eye opening. Thank you. And I'm kind of like, You're welcome. I want it to be eye opening, but not discouraging. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I mean, like I like I keep saying, um, it was very hard, and I don't I don't sugarcoat it. But you do see the results at the end of the day, and that's why I brought up the fact that you know people who are wealthy and come from wealth that is in most cases that's how they got to it i think there's a figure that's kind of stated i haven't interviewed interviewed every millionaire so i don't know for sure but it's kind of <laughs> out there that 90 percent of the world's millionaires got their money from real estate um and someone mentioned in the chat about this being pretty nasa centric which is true because i'm i'm sorry i live in nasa <laughs> but um you don't have to look at you know those two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollar properties. You can buy on the out islands as well, where you could find property for thirty thousand. Yep. Um, yep. Develop that. You could build up equity the same way. It might not end up being worth as much as in Nassau, but I mean, you could buy that, get a small loan to buy it. You could build it out of pocket, take your time with it, and then values also go up over time. Um, there are certain islands. I think Eleuthera is a you know a hot spot right now. A lot of people are investing in Eleuthera. Um, I mean, if you think about it, Nassau properties were also very cheap a long time ago too. So a lot of it comes down to investing when development is happening and getting ahead of the game. Um, family islands are not off the table. I encourage people to buy family islands um, and develop those too. Nassau is so overpopulated. I know all the jobs are here. Um, but even if you want to build a vacation home and you just add that to your portfolio of your real estate investments, it's still an, you know, an investment is an investment. Um, you don't have to kill yourself trying to get a property in Nassau. You yeah. can, like I said, you could buy cheaper land on another island and take your time developing that. And even if it's not, you know, even if you don't finish until you're ready to retire, now you have somewhere to retire. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think we're not talking too much about family islands because we just don't know enough. <laughs> yeah. To be giving <laughs> like information. I, said, I, mean, I live in Nassau, so I talk about Nassau, but. Yeah. Um, um, I think my... people generally know that property is a bit cheaper um, mm -hmm. on the family islands. And there, there are also challenges where it might be more expensive to build. So you have to get your, mm -hmm. your material there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, depending on the island, are people there who can do the work? Do you need to bring people? Are you going to be flying mm -hmm. back and forth to supervise the work? Yeah. Um, but I think largely speaking, it's sort of a dream for all of us, right? To be able to get out yeah. of this. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that's why I said, that's why I didn't even mention going to the to finance building on that island. I just said, you know, go at your own pace. Um, because you can, and it is hard, like you will have to be going back and forth. You have to send stuff on the mailboat and what have you, depending on the island. Um, but yeah, go in phases, go at your own pace. And these are the things that people or agents would advise you based on your own circumstances and what, what might work well for you. It's not always, you must buy in super expensive Nassau and you know get this crazy mortgage. There are other ways to own. Uh, someone's asking if married people are favored over single people with qualification for mortgage. Um, so again, I'm not a bank, so I can't speak for the bank. But what I will say, and I did <laughs> see someone say this a while ago online, um, multiple incomes are better than mm -hmm. one. Like I said, I have multiple in incomes. I had to have multiple incomes to get to this point. Um, if I were married to someone who also had multiple incomes, then yes, we would both qualify for more. Um, yeah, I think it is favorable to kind of have that, I guess, legal link to someone <laughs> who both of your incomes are combined. Um, but I cannot, I, I can't speak for the bank in saying that yes, they prefer them over single people. Um, but I think it just comes down to, to income. I mean, you might have a couple where one person is making a million the other person doesn't work at all so in that sense being married doesn't really do anything for their um their qualification but it's i think it comes i think again i'm not the bank but I, I think it comes down to the income and what seems most reliable what seems most stable and who can pay them back <laughs> more reliably basically yeah uh, we didn't talk about life insurance someone's asking yeah. um 
when you get a mortgage, they will require you to have life insurance. You don't necessarily need it before you go to the bank, but they might, I don't know, they might like you better if you have it already. <laughs> um, but it, it will be a requirement before they do give you a mortgage. Um, but sometimes they will also bundle that into your mortgage if you don't feel like finding your own and shopping around. So that's an option too. What does that mean? What do you mean? Like they would insure like, your life? No. So they might have a partnership with an insurance company okay. and that they might like put it into your mortgage exp um, expenses so that it doesn't necessarily look like a, an extra expense. So it's just included in your monthly payments. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we're at the hour mark, folks. Do you, do, does anyone want to unmute to ask a question, to express a thought in your own words, in your own voice? Just raise your hand so we can see that you want to say something and you'll be able to. And maybe while people are thinking or getting the nerve to unmute, uh, <laughs> can you tell us about the phases of building? Like, what does that process look like? <laughs> you tired, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're calling some past trauma here. <laughs> um, obviously, foundation would be the first stage, pretty much. Um, you'd have to dig it out and lay it down. And your electrician and plumber will have to put their piping into the foundation. Um, and then I think you would get up to, obviously, you would start building the walls and whatnot. And that's when you get up to the belt course period. Um, which would be right before the roof goes on. Um, I'm honestly trying to <laughs> recall my stages now. Um, yeah, are after there the any stages, are there any stages where you're not really able to comfortably stop and go? Like, is there a part where, like, this is not a great time to take a break? Like, you need to get to the next belt point? course. <laughs> yeah. Definitely belt course. You are gonna want to have a roof on. Um, and then once the roof is on, you are gonna want obviously windows and doors because God forbid there's a hurricane and you have an unstable roof and a bunch of empty spaces in your building to allow in heavy wind and rain that could just flatten the whole thing. So that's yeah, foundation, you know, we could kind of come back to later, but uh <laughs> um you were once you hit bell course you were gonna also want to finish with your roof and windows and whatnot can you tell us what the belt course is i feel like we talk about it all the time now you've done it <laughs> <laughs> now you've done it um so i am not a contractor <laughs> i just trust my contractor aka my daddy um <laughs> my understanding is that it would be basically when you see a building that has walls up but the roof is not on yet um that is again my understanding i'm not a contractor please i would welcome a, a contractor to come and correct me but <laughs> that was my understanding when i was going through the process um yeah so that's kind of, that's kind of a good pause point then that's why people say get up to that point and then you can um at that point you would have a good equity okay. um I didn't feel comfortable stopping at that point because I was like, I need a roof on. Um, and for me, I got to the point like right when hurricane season was starting and that was why I was like, let me finish this roof. <laughs> um, but if it's let's say December and then you wanna reapproach the bank, then yeah, by that point you would have a good amount of equity put in and you, you, know, you might've halved your costs of what the bank might need to cover to finish it, so. Mm -hmm. And if you do go back to the bank, do they just add that onto your current mortgage? They could, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You could also go to, you know, you could shop around at different banks, but I think you would have to transfer your current loan over to the next bank, but you can still shop around when it comes to getting, you know, applying for a construction loan later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Someone wants to know what the process is like getting your building plan approved? 
if I speak <laughs> um, long, very long. Um, in my case, obviously the pandemic pushed mine way back, but I have heard many horror stories of waiting close to a year, half a year. I, I want to say most people wait at least four months. And then when it comes to um, getting your inspections, you might go through the same thing. <laughs> um, a very long time um, to get those approvals sometimes. Um, and that's why I said, when you weigh up the cons of building and buying, you know, when you're buying a place, as soon as a sale closes, you can move in. When you are building, all these things might hold you back for a prolonged amount of time. I thought I was going to be in this house by Christmas, and my power did not turn on until late July. So it happens. <laughs> um, and, you know, because I have been so open with my own process, I've encountered so many people who have been saying they experience the same thing, their auntie experience the same thing, their uncle experience the same thing. Um, you really just have to be prepared for whatever happens sometimes you know your plants may get lost they go to a different department anything could happen <laughs> um sales could also take a long time to close but i think there's just so many extra steps in building that could prolong it that you just don't foresee until you're in it so you really have to basically you should be in a comfortable living situation before you get started because you know let's say you might be getting evicted next month you don't know if that building is going to be done next month <laughs> Um, so all of these things are just things to consider. Okay. Um, and if you have an idea of what you want in terms of building, what is that process like with getting the plans? Are you going to an architect? Like what, what does that look like? Yeah. Um, you can go to an architect and you would have a discussion with them and say, this is what I want. And they could help to bring your vision to life. Um, a lot of architects also have very basic plans. That's what I did because I didn't have no time for that. I was like, I want to be in my house. <laughs> Please give me something quick. <laughs> um, but no, architects are there to basically help to bring your vision to life. Um, so that's something that you discuss at the very beginning. And is there anything that you think of now that you could have done differently? Um, I have a, a friend who built a house on her own and now she's like I don't know why I have all these windows <laughs> this was not a great idea yeah. so many things I look at and I'm just like why did I think this was a good idea <laughs> it's like um when it's your first time even when you're looking at plans you don't really know how it's going to materialize until you see it um so it's like now with me being an agent because like I said I became an agent this year after I had already done all this stuff now I look at stuff completely differently but Back then, I was just like, oh, this, you know, looks good to me. I don't really know what I'm looking at, but go ahead and do it. Um, <laughs> and then when it, you know, came to life, I was like, who signed off on this? But it was me. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was you. It was me. <laughs> um, but as a beginner, there are, I mean, it's, you know, it's baby steps. It's all a learning process. And I do speak to a lot of other people who like your friend. They were telling me, they're like, I looked at it when I was done and I was like, why did I, <laughs> like, why did I do this like this? Why did I put that window there? Um, but I think that's why after the first build or after the first purchase, people learn so much through the experience. And that's why I try to share mine um, because so much of it, you just don't know until you get started. Um, but you know, it's not the end of the world. Things can be updated, things can be changed and amended. It might be expensive, but you know, it's all a learning process. Um, and that's why I said it does help you to see things differently in life. You know, um, I would have been, I'm one of those people who like everything done perfectly according to plan. And I've learned that I can't keep doing that because it doesn't happen. <laughs> um, yeah, you learn, you know, patience, you learn discipline, you learn just different outlooks on things. Um, and like I said, going back and changing your plan and amending things based on circumstances are definitely, that's something that you will learn in this process. It, it also doesn't sound like it was particularly easy financially. You know, first you like really, really, really saved. 
to get that down payment. And then it was doing what you got to do to make the mortgage payment and also build on your own. Mm -hmm. I imagine that that came with some, some sacrifice. A lot of sacrifices. Um, and this goes back to what I was just saying with that this process does kind of shed light on how you view things in life. I kind of got to a point towards the end. I mean, I'm still going, it's not completely done, but I consider in my head, I'm like, I'm done because <laughs> I'm mentally done. <laughs> you know, I still have, you know, some finishing touches to, you know, painting stuff like that to do. But um, I got to a point where, you know, I had to choose between discipline and punishing myself. And this is something I think I would have done differently if I had started over from the beginning is that my eye was so much on the end goal. I was really neglecting self-care. And that's something with, you know, me being a woman, I'm very passionate about um, inspiring other women to take care of themselves. And I mean, anyone in general, but obviously this is Women's Wednesday. <laughs> um, one thing I would have done if I look back, I had such a strict budget and my friends would tell you, sometimes I'd be like, hey, let's go out for lunch. And I'm like, I don't have lunch money. And I'm like, it's like $20. And I'm like, that $20 could go towards X, Y, Z in my house. Um, but I think you do have to be disciplined. You do have to stick to a strict budget. But um, I think you should also include in that budget something to take care of yourself. You know, don't, don't buy a Porsche, but, <laughs> you know, go out for lunch sometimes, go to the movies, get a facial, do something to relax yourself. It doesn't even have to be, you know, money-wise, but just something to take care of yourself along the way um, because it is such a hard process and you don't want to get to the point where you're getting sick or you're literally killing yourself or stressing yourself out too much it is stressful there's no way you know you can't sugarcoat that but um yeah that's my at this point that's my biggest advice is don't let discipline become punishment um because then you're teaching yourself you know you don't deserve this because you're not paying for it <laughs> um you can budget you can save but you know be careful and you know just try to be nice to yourself that's what i would have told my <laughs> that's what i would have told 22 year old me that i got started yeah i think that's really important because we can really be laser focused on a goal and i think that's really uh, a really important distinction that you made between having discipline and punishing yourself you don't mm -hmm. want to get to the place where you resent <laughs> yourself yeah. for your goal yeah, no, or exactly. you hate your house uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah no for sure I mean like when you start asking questions and I was like oh the wound is still fresh it's because it got to a point where it was just so hard like and me being an agent as well it was hard to talk about like people ask me for building advice and I'd be like honestly I can't talk about this right now like it's too tough I know a lot of agents as well who you know have done the same thing they built for themselves and it's the same conversation when I speak to them they're like oh you know, don't get me started. <laughs> it's it's hard. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've had people recently, I just, you know, the pandemic happened, so I wasn't really traveling, but I've had people this summer telling me, oh, you're always traveling. And I'm like, actually, no, I wasn't taking vacation at all for like two years because I was, I didn't want to take vacation. But I was just sitting in my house. Like I wanted to go and, you know, do something. And now that it's coming to the end stages, in fact, I'm going away next week. I'm like, I need a break, like a break break. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, stuff like that, taking care of yourself, being good to yourself is important anyway, but after something as challenging as saving every penny for years on end, I mean, the down payment was one thing and that felt like, you know, winning the end of the race. I mean, I don't exercise, but I imagine this is what people who, who race go through when you're approaching the finish line and then you finish and, and you can't breathe but you're like oh it's right there and then you finish and you collapse that's what I imagine it's like you've just been holding your breath but it's for years like it is hard but like I said it does pay off um when you hear the wealthy people saying everyone has an apartment because that's what you know that's what their world is um real estate wealthy people you will find they all own a bunch of real estate um, and that's why I do encourage young people to at least think about it. And even if you don't want to, you know, if it's not financially feasible for you to do it in the next five years, you know, think about it, set it as a goal, even if that's your retirement present, you know, work towards it. You, and at the end of the day, you need somewhere to live. We all are alive. We need somewhere to live. Um, and I think this is something that people do take for granted. 
And it is unfortunately something that I see a lot, not, to, not necessarily speaking as an agent, but just as a Bahamian in general. Um, people rely on, oh, my Grammy has a house and then Grammy passes and we find out there was some legal issue with the house that no one could have foreseen. And guess what? The house goes to no one in the family. The house that you were relying on, suddenly you don't have it. <laughs> and then you are, you know, at a certain age and now you have to start suddenly thinking, I need to buy somewhere to live when I retire. Um, so on that note, I would say have those conversations, make sure all your papers are straight, um, have those legal documents saved, protect yourself. Um, but also it, you know, it, it is grim, but you do want to think about those worst case scenarios and you want to be prepared. Um, um, not to diss my parents, but my parents are, you know, <laughs> a little older. So I think that might've been something that contributed to me thinking so far ahead at such a young age is that I didn't really have that safety net of, oh, I'll just live with my parents forever because, you know, you do have to start thinking ahead. Um, so that that's just some extra advice. Um, yeah. I don't really remember what the question was. I'm sorry. I do. I ramble a lot, but. <laughs> oh, we talked about healthcare and <laughs> morphed into goals. Yeah. Uh, so someone is saying, and this is really interesting because people do say this, um, single family residences are often considered a dead investment. Um, what, what do you think about this perspective? Um, and what advice do you have for investing in income producing properties over single home residences? So um, this, I did also have the same mindset but this is why I kept saying throughout this segment that um, so much of this comes down to circumstances and each individual's personal situation. Um, as an individual, no, you don't necessarily need a five bedroom house. If you want a five bedroom house, you know, good for you, you could get a five bedroom house, but um, it is likely gonna be a huge mortgage. And let's say you do start a family later down the line. Um, like I said, I mean, in the mean, if you could pay it off by the time you have the family, but it's like in the meantime, you are paying, you know, a large amount on something that you don't necessarily need to. And I think this goes back to what I said earlier is that people see home ownership as just home ownership and it's not. Um, so part of what inspired me when I was speaking to my coworker at the time, the one who I said bought her first property when she was 25 was that um, she had a young baby at the time. And her thinking was, well, even if I don't live here forever, I think it was an apartment. She was like, even if I don't live here forever, sorry if you're watching this, I'm telling other business, but <laughs> she said, um, my daughter can live here or I can sell it. And that's what made me think, wow, I, my first property doesn't have to be my property forever. Um, so that was why I decided to go with a duplex. I was like, I can live in one, I can rent one out. Um, like I said, my parents are getting up there in age, so... <laughs> they could you know, live next door of anything. Um, and that is again, why I keep saying so much of this comes down to your individual preferences. Um, you'll find a lot of, I guess, a lot of men kind of from a few generations ago would have bought family houses before they had the family and started to pay them off by the time they have a family. But I guess also because um, the dynamics are changing, ch sorry, dynamics are changing these days. Not everyone aspires for a family. You just don't know what your future is gonna bring. You could always buy an apartment. You could always buy a multifamily property and sell it later if you want to. Um, and that's why I don't really think any real estate investment is a bad investment because you're not stuck with it forever. You might, I mean, people are intimidated by mortgages but you can pay those off early. Um, you can sell it. You can get a little profit, especially if you, you know, fix it up in the meantime or took good care of it in the meantime. Um, and what I advise investing in income producing properties. Yeah, I mean, my approach is why not? <laughs> like, um, and I, I wanted to touch on this again because someone in the chat said something about renting forever. And I think there's a stigma against single family properties. There's also a stigma against renting and neither of those things I think deserve the bad, is it bad rap or bad rap <laughs> that they have. Um, they both serve a purpose. I mean, a lot of people grew up in single family houses and I mean, they have their purpose, which is to house a family. Um, or, I mean, 
I mentioned earlier, there isn't enough, in my opinion, house sharing or young, among young, young adults. Who's to stop you from renting out the other rooms to your friends or, you know, like, I think a lot of Bahamians in general see real estate through that kind of lens of just, I own this home and that's it. But there's so many different, you know, opportunities that aren't really talked about. So yeah, you could rent out those rooms, you could sell the house. Um, and then same for multifamilies, you could rent out the second unit, you could sell it. And like I said, um, renting does serve its own purpose. Um, people call that dead money as well. But again, that depends on your circumstances. Um, I paid rent as a student when I was in England. I didn't know if I wanted to live there forever, but I needed somewhere to live. So I paid rent and was it dead money? Not really, because I needed somewhere to live. Um, would I like the money back? Yes, <laughs> but. <laughs> yeah, um, you kind of have to just meet your own needs, right? And I'm glad exactly. that, that we're talking about this because the way that we live is constantly changing. It exactly. might be a cycle that we're sort of going back to old ways and then finding different ways and then going back to the old ways again. Mm -hmm. um, but some people don't want to live that close to other people. So they want to be on a, uh -huh. a single a single exactly, um, yeah. piece of property. Like they don't want to hear the neighbor's dog barking. Or, exactly. So know. much of this just comes down to your personal preference that I can't really say objectively one is better than the other. Um, and then communal living, I think that some people are leaning in that direction now. Yes. Um, like you said, like friends living together. Mm -hmm. um, I have friends that we we talk all the time about, well, we should just buy this, you know, these dreams. Let's just buy this piece and of why not? And just build like tiny <laughs> houses in a little rectangle. And, you know, and as we you, age, we'll be there know. for each other. People do it. Like, you know, when you see these wealthy families, that's how a lot of them got wealthy. They put their money together and they invested. Um, so yeah, the possible there's so many possibilities that we just don't talk about enough. And a lot of it really just comes down to what do you want to do and what works for you. Mm -hmm. And if it stops working for you, sell it, <laughs> rent it out, you know, you're not you're not as stuck with it forever as you would think. Yeah. And then you talked about aging, and I don't think we talk about that enough when we're talking about housing. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we build for ourselves or buy for ourselves. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think we are realistic enough about the fact that we're no. aging and that our mobility yeah, no. <laughs> changes <laughs> over time. All mm -hmm. these two story houses going up and I'm just like, how long do you think you could go up those stairs? Listen, me as a freshly 25 year old, I'm like, I ain't going up no stairs. <laughs> if I go up some stairs, that's it for the day. I would live in a condo on a second floor, but I'm not going downstairs to go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think we don't have the conversation enough because it is such a morbid, kind of depressing conversation, but you do have to have it. Um, you, as long as you're alive, you need somewhere to live. You have to consider these things as you age um, and kind of think ahead. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's what I would I say. I think people are, are thinking about climate, like, I know that's what I'm thinking about. Like, as, as I start yeah, for looking sure. for, you know, what do I want to buy? I'm definitely thinking about losing land um, and building mm -hmm. higher up. And that comes with a compromise because how do you figure out accessibility if you ever become a wheelchair user? Yes. How are you going to figure out how you're going to get in and out of the house that you're building on stilts or on a higher foundation? Um, these mm -hmm. are things to think about. Um, and even if you don't think about yourself aging, our parents and our grandparents are aging and where are they going to go? We gonna exactly. Come with them? They're going to come live with us, you know? Exactly. That was why I said that having older parents, I think did influence my decision a lot. Um, you know, my grandmother and my mother aren't that far in age and I could kind of see my mom having to take on my grandmother. And I was like, Oh, I have to do that <laughs> too. <laughs> so uh, that, you know, that did come a lot into my decision-making. I didn't really think, Oh, I can just live with my parents forever because you know, I don't want to speak it into existence, but soon enough, I will have to think about actually, no, they're going to have to live with me. And where are we going to live? Well, I just made it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I see someone is saying that they know people who have no desire to own a home. They prefer to rent. And you're right. It mm -hmm. depends on individual circumstances. We have to think outside the box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's Absolutely. right. I mean, as an agent, you would expect me to say, no, everyone needs to own a home, but I mean, you don't necessarily have to, that's not what you want. And that's not what you want. 
Um, and again, preference, some people like to country pop. You might want to move every two years. Why would you buy somewhere and then move across the world and then you still have a, you know, that tie to the country being dead <laughs> in a different country? Um, I think it's preferable for sure to own an old age um, because you won't be working and, you know, you don't want to be throwing your limited income at um, rent payments and then you know, what if, you know, you can't work anymore and you don't have any money left and you still need somewhere to live. So I'd say in old age, for sure, you should think about, you know, home ownership. But as a young person, particularly, it really comes down to your preference. And that's why I said renting isn't necessarily, to me, dead money because it serves a purpose. Um, people need places that they could rent because, I mean, you might have people working on a contract who are only somewhere for one year or they just want to try out different countries. That's fine as well. You don't, where would you live if you couldn't rent it? You know, it's a temporary situation. A lot of it just comes down to you and your, your circumstance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not, not holding yourself to other people's standards and really mm -hmm. figuring out what's going to work for you today. 10 years from now, 30 years exactly. from now, do you want to own? What is that going to mean for you in terms of um, not just financial responsibility, but everything else? Like, are you committing to living in a particular place, finding tenants, you know, all, all the things that, that come with it. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's a decision that people have to make on their own, but it's good to have the information and to for know sure, yeah. that, okay, this is what a down payment looks like. This is the process for finding out how much I can get based on mm -hmm. what I make right now. And, you know, even if you go to get pre-qualified and, and the amount just isn't what you need, now you know what you need to do. You need to go ask for a raise. Yeah. You need to, exactly. get, you know, get <laughs> exactly. a better I mean, job, I, whatever. I get so many people come to me and they're like, oh, I want to buy a property before the end of the year. And I'm like, oh, great. Did you get pre-qualified? And they're like, no, not yet, because I want it by the end of the year. And I'm like, you might get to the end of the year and then realize you can't do anything. So I'm like, it, it costs you nothing to go to the bank. I mean, unless they start charging, which I don't think they will. <laughs> um, and say, what could I get right now? And then if it's not favorable, then you know, yeah. Like you said, you know what you have to do. You have to either get, you know, get a side job, you know, get tighter with your budget and then come back later on and see where you stand after that. And then hopefully you'll be in a better position. And go to multiple financial institutions, not just the bank. Oh, yes. bank. Yeah, no, yeah. You could go to credit unions. You could go to Bahamas Mortgage Corporation, um, private lenders. Um, this is something I keep bringing up wealthy people. I'm so sorry, but <laughs> you know, that famous quote by Donald Trump where he was like oh my dad gave me a small loan of a million dollars you will find that so many wealthy people get loans from their family and it's because a lot of them have that real estate money they sold properties they have a couple hundred grand in cash and that's how they did it um I think yeah we don't talk about these things openly enough and it, like I said it's not just I own a home. <laughs> these are all things that come into it. And these are all possibilities once you get to that stage of where you could be, you know, down the line. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and someone said generational wealth. That is, that's exactly, exactly what it is. Um, and like I said, not even just getting the cash and giving it to your kids, but you pass on the assets, um, a property that was worth let's say 40,000, 20 years ago, might be worth 200,000 today. Um, imagine you just get that from your parents and you didn't do anything for it. So this is why I do advocate for ownership in that sense, if that's what you aspire for, I think it's a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's collateral if something mm -hmm. devastating happens and you need money. For fast, sure, yeah. And a lot of it. I can't tell you how many times I'm like, you know what, I want to move to Bali. <laughs> and I'm like, I could just sell my property. I'm not going to do it because I'm committed to being an agent here for you guys. But, <laughs> um, you know, the possibility is there. Um, I'm someone who likes stability and comfort. So having that, I think that's what really kept me going throughout this process of how hard it was, was knowing at the end of the day, I will have that like extreme comfort and stability that 
um, most people my age, frankly, don't have. Um, yeah, I can't say it enough. It's, it's. I mean, it, it was expensive. I could put a price on it, but it is priceless <laughs> to me. Mm -hmm. You know, to have that peace of mind. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing so many of your personal experiences and your expertise and things that you've learned the hard way so that we might not have to learn the hard way. We can kind of go in with our eyes open and having a better sense of what is required and some of the homework that we need to do before we start just like yeah, <laughs> paying, yeah. <laughs> paying out all the little, all little coins. Um, any closing words, any last thing that you want to say and definitely give everyone your um, socials again? Um, well, I'll say my socials before I forget. So it's at Bahana, B-A-H-H-A-N-N-A-H -H -N -N -A -H <laughs> underscore. And then my email is hbeard, H-B-E-A-R-D at B-H-H-S-B dot com. Um, yeah, I, just to, you know, reiterate the stuff that I, I said before is um, it is tough, but it is worth it. Um, it puts you just in a different in a different bracket that I personally don't see any other method of getting that way unless you do hit the lottery or invest in some crazy stock that you know goes insane overnight. Like if you bought Bitcoin in 10 years ago or something like that. Um, it's known as one of the safest investments, one of the safest routes to creating wealth. Um, so for that reason, I would advise people who are looking for that stability and that sense of comfort and peace of mind. Um, and like we mentioned, generational wealth, definitely, even if you're not in the financial position to do it right now, you know, start putting a plan in place, at least speak to the bank, see where you stand, see, um, see what you need to do to get to that point. Um, and one thing that I found when I was going through it was that you know, when you don't have the savings, you think, oh, I can never do that. But now I'm looking back at what I spent. And I'm like, I don't even know where the money came from because I honestly don't earn that much. <laughs> but it was it was the budgeting. And once you get to that point, you realize, wow, I can do the next one. So like I said, I bought my little Japanese baby car <laughs> when I was 18. And I was like, oh, wow, actually, maybe I could do something else. And then I saved my down payment. I was like, actually, maybe I could build. And now that I built, now I'm like, I'm scared to imagine what I'm gonna do next, but you know, I know I could do it. It seems impossible until you get there. And actually, I've said this before, sorry, I might be going over time, but I said this before um, when I was like 15, 16, I said to someone, um, I wanna own a Lexus by the time I'm 15, because you know, I, I won't be able to own a house. You hear that so much that young people cannot own property, period, that I just even, you know, I was like 15, 16, and I was just in my head, I was like, I'm never gonna own a house because everyone says you can't own a house um and i know you know it is very hard a lot of people might not have the means to do it but it seems impossible until you do it um and you know worst case you try and then you might not get there but you might have significant savings built up in the process <laughs> so it isn't you know trying at least you can't lose by trying um so that was what i'd say at least you know take this information think about it, think about what applies to you, have a discussion with an agent, <clears throat> me, <laughs> um, and take it from there and at least, you know, take the first step and see where you could go because it might lead to more than you, you know, more than you would bargain for. Like I said, I wasn't an agent when I got started, so I didn't know what my property value would be by the time I finished, but I'm very happy with what it potentially is right now. It's more than all I thought was, oh, I want to live by myself so I'm gonna go and do it but um it really does pay off um it's very hard but it does pay off just like running the figurative race I mentioned <laughs> yeah all right so we we know that we need to save mm -hmm. for that down payment and once you have a good chunk you can probably look at the options okay. at mm -hmm. banks at credit unions credit unions tend to have way better interest rates yes um, go for a fixed a fixed term um, deposit if you can, or if you have something higher earning, you can do that to earn mm -hmm. some interest on what might seem like meager savings. Um, mm -hmm. Go to the bank, don't delay going to find out what you qualify for. Um, and even if it's not the amount that you hope for, 
you can you can change that by mm -hmm. yeah. finding other ways other other sources of income um, mm -hmm. think about whether you want to build or buy consider the the pros and cons that we talked about here and there are many more to think about if you want this really specific layout and design then you probably are looking at building and if you just want somewhere comfortable to live then you can probably look at some properties that are out there repossessed property is a great option um a little bit lower cost um, a lot of those are through banks so i think someone earlier was asking how to find repossessed yeah property. so a, a good amount of repossessed properties are actually listed like you will find them on real estate websites um but you can also go straight to the bank's websites themselves Sometimes there are hundreds and it can be really daunting to look through. Um, so you might want to speak with an agent anyway, just because it is very, I looked at repossessed properties like alone and I got very <laughs> overwhelmed <laughs> when I was in my search. Um, so yeah, you could look at the bank directly or you could look at a real estate website or you could speak to an agent or you could do all the above if you like yeah. research. <laughs> look at the options. Know that you can reach out to a real estate agent and it doesn't cost you money. It costs the buyer, <laughs> says the seller. The seller. <laughs> Oh, the seller. So you know, the cost of the seller. Yeah. So as the buyer, you have an advantage. Um, so you can get some help through this process and you don't have to go through it alone. Um, and then there are all these costs. So expect to need to come up with double the down payment to be able to get through all of the, the closing costs and maybe start thinking about the people that you want on your team who are, you know, the people who are handy, the people who your family has worked with for years because they're a really great electrician you can get to go with you to look at a place to see if everything looks good or if there are any potential problems that they can spot that you might not be able to spot. Um, and when you undertake this process, don't forget to take care of yourself and to include in your budget some self-care, okay. some time with your friends. Um, remember that self-care doesn't have to cost money. No, it can just yeah. be kind to yourself. It can be a dip in the ocean. We're very lucky to live in a place where we could yeah. just jump in the ocean. Um, mm -hmm. So always think about balancing those things throughout really exciting but also what can be a really challenging undertaking yeah for individuals and I do worry that I did <laughs> make it sound too scary but you know I wanted to be realistic and I do just want to stress it does you know it does work out and again this is my first project you will see developers who do this all the time and they you know they flip through millions because like I said they do it all the time the first is always the hardest. It's a learning process. Um, but once you get through it, you learn so much for the next stage. Do I want to do it again? Maybe not, but <laughs> you know, it you know, there it paid off anyway. So that's what I'd like my that's what I'd like you guys to take home from this. That um it's very hard, but uh, you know, most things that pay off, they are hard. <laughs> if it yeah. wasn't hard, then everyone would do it. <laughs> um but that's why there is such a huge payoff in the end. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Hannah, for being here with us and, and sharing all of this. And thank you everyone for joining us and for giving really great questions to expand the conversation and to deepen the conversation as well. Um, Women's Wednesdays is generally every first Wednesday of the month. Next month, it's going to be on the second Wednesday. So join us then at six, we will be looking at the Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs focusing on goal five, which is on gender equality and goal three, which is good health and well-being with a focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights. And I'll be talking about one of my new favorite topics, which is menstrual cups. <laughs> so get excited <laughs> and join us for that. Um, look out for the event information to be on our social media channels. If you don't already follow us, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Equality242 or just search Equality Bahamas. And our CDOS speaker series continues on September 24th, where we will be joined by another expert member of the CDAW committee looking at article six on trafficking and exploitation of prostitution. Should be a really interesting conversation where we talk about sex work and the words that we use for sex work and what it means to be trafficked and what states, and in particular the Bahamas needs to do about it. Um, I'm putting the link for that in the chat for those who are on Zoom and those who aren't. You'll be able to register at tiny.cc slash cedaw. That's C-E-D-A-W-6. Enjoy the rest of your evening and we will see you at the next couple of events.
Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I hope this was helpful. And if you do have any more questions, feel free to reach out on you know my socials or send an email. Um, yeah, thank you again.